Hello, 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 and welcome live to Montana's Ribbon Chop House for Cat Chat. There we go. Love to hear that. Big loud round of applause for a uh, two-win week in Missoula. How about that? There you go. All right. First time both teams won there since 2010, and boy, was that a lot of fun. A heck of a Saturday in Missoula for the Bobcats. So uh, we're going to be visiting with a couple of players a little later in the show. We'll talk with uh, Raekwon Battle and uh, Grace Beasley. We'll talk with head coach uh, Trisha Binford later as well. But right now uh, we are with uh, head coach Danny Sprinkle. Coach, how we doing? How we feeling? Doing great. Great to see everybody, uh, especially after a game like last Saturday for both squads. Yeah, no doubt about it. And uh, the doubleheader too, which is kind of cool. We'll have the doubleheader um, here on February 18th as well. So that was a 2 o'clock tip and a 7 o'clock tip, but kind of nice to have the two games in one day. I know I had a chance to watch the women play, and then later that night we had the men. So it's kind of nice to be able to just do both those games in one day, big day of basketball. Yeah, I mean, it's great, and it's it's great for the fans too because that way they can travel and they can go to both games. And, and obviously the sport, you know, I can't wait to see – you know, what the sport's like here in Bozeman at Brick Breeding the night we play them here. Yeah, no doubt about it. So that's going to be a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, you could definitely hear the Bobcat fans there on Saturday too. Oh, yeah, and they had a lot to cheer, loud, cheer about <laughs> both games too, especially at the end. <laughs> yes, they did. Yes, they did. All right, well, uh, let's dive right into things here. We're going to talk about this 67-64 uh, win for the men. Uh, a really tight contest, a, a fun, fun game to watch. Uh, but I want to go back to before this game started, yeah. you had mentioned to me uh, that the players held a player's only meaning about what was expected of some of these guys uh, what was a little bit about that about it and kind of what do you know about it yeah I don't know too much about it to be honest with you you know that was just our that was our leaders taking control of the team and and probably just making sure that you know the younger guys and guys who hadn't been through that game before you know knew what to expect and what their expectations of uh, the, the younger guys was and obviously whatever it was it worked you know and uh, you know that was probably the most unified and connected you know, we've been in a couple weeks. Yeah, tell me a little more about that unified and connected. Like, how have you seen it kind of grow or go up and down? Like, why did you see it come together there, and had you seen it dip beforehand? Yeah, I mean, early in the season, we had so many new parts, and uh, we have so many good players that were trying to find their way and, and not only learning new plays and new defensive schemes, uh, and not only that, they're different teammates, you know, and we're doing it on the road, uh, which I think helps team chemistry when you're traveling, staying in the hotels, and, you know, you can't do anything but spend time together. And so... <laughs> Uh, it's been a it's been a work in progress, but you know we have such high character guys and they get along, uh, and they they really root for each other. It's an unselfish group, uh, which is why I think you know the ceiling is very high for this team. Yeah, no doubt about it. Especially after a win like that with Montana State now at 13 and eight overall, uh, six and two in the Big Sky. Darius Brown had 23 points in this game. Raquan Battle, who we'll talk with later, had 18, and Jabril Bello had 11. Uh, in this contest and you know one of their stars Josh Bannon he's a great player he leads them in points rebounds yeah. assist one of the really skilled players in this uh, in this league y'all held him to five points seven rebounds on two of five shooting you guys did a really nice job against Bannon in this game yeah our guys did a tremendous job and we'd really focused on him you know most of the week because he's such a matchup problem he can play inside or outside and you know you got to give our guys credit they uh, they did a tremendous job locking into him and being engaged uh, whether they were switched on him or they were guarding him the whole possession and just did a good job making it tough on him. You know, even the couple shots he made, you know, he scored over us, which is one of our goals. And, and you know, we just don't feel teams can beat us if we make them score over us the entire game. If we have breakdowns and they get layups, then it's a different story. Yeah, that's uh, pretty impressive stuff. And then uh, Brandon Whitney in this game, too, you know, he's one of their kind of shifty guards. He's another very good scorer who's, you know, been up very and good. down this year. Yeah. In that first half, he was really, really strong, but you guys did slow him down in that second half. What would you feel like was some of the change through that uh, that halftime period? Yeah, I mean, he's a good player. He's really strong and quick. And, you know, they kind of got to spread out a little bit in the first half. And so we did a pretty good job, you know, even guarding him. He made some tough shots, you know, which he's going to do because he's a good player. Uh, but even in the second half, we had some really good switches. Uh, you know, Caleb Fuller switched on to him. Great Osobar switched on to him at different times and did a great job really just walling him up and using their length. And he didn't look to score over them, you know, because of their size. And so, you know, we're going to have to, you know, figure out some different ways, obviously, to guard him and even Bannon. You know, he's going to be more aggressive when we play him here. Uh, but there was a lot of things that we got to clean up too because I don't think we didn't play the cleanest game either, you know, which is good that we can still go up to Dahlberg and win. Uh, but we can also learn from a lot of things we've got to do better. Well, what were some of the things that you do want to be better? I mean, uh, some of the numbers were good, right? Only eight turnovers in this game. That's pretty darn impressive. But some Great. of the things uh, you were looking at, what are some of the things you want to clean up moving forward? Yeah, I mean, one thing we take a lot of pride in, you know, is our defense and our rebounding. And we got out-rebounded by 14. 
uh, you know, which do I know our guys feel the same, you know, is unacceptable. And so, you know, we got to up the ante in that, in that regard. Uh, but we always talk offensively, you know, if we turn the ball over 10 or less times, you know, we have a great chance to win as long as we know we're going to defend and rebound for the most part. And uh, if we can just get a shot on the rim, we can be pretty good offensively. Yeah, no doubt about it. Uh, I do want to talk about a couple of the uh, the one-on-one -on -one defensive moments we saw in this game, particularly uh, from your bigs so late in this game. So first of all, Deshaun Thomas was their uh, their big guy who hit that late three in the game. He's a 6'9 transfer from Colorado State, right? 6'9, 240, and he could really handle the basketball. Yeah. And I, I know late in that game he scored over Bellow, but watching Jabril Bellow guard him while he was trying to break it down, I thought that was such impressive defense a big moment in that game it was uh you know and even a couple of the shots he hit Jabril did a great job guarding him he just he made some tough one-footed step backs uh but not only just those possessions but I mean for the entire game you know great all of our guys you know our post guys they had to guard on the perimeter the majority of the game and they're not post guys aren't trained to do that a lot so <laughs> yeah. you know that's why you know Montana is a, a difficult matchup at times and so but they, they did a tremendous job uh, guarding on the perimeter, moving their feet, and then still going back in there and rebounding too. Uh, and then another one of those moments too, I thought a uh, great Osabor against Brandon Whitney. I mean, for a big man to go yeah. up against a guard like that who was feeling it that day, I yeah. mean, you just don't see bigs being able to stay in front. And Whitney ended up having to get into the lane, turned around, and he passed it out. Like, that's really impressive stuff. Exactly, and that's one of the kind of switches I was talking about that him and Caleb both had where – you know, Whitney would have had a layup if they didn't switch off in time. And they did a great job. And, and not only that, you know, not fouling him, you know, when he gets down there reaching or being undisciplined. And they did a great job. And, and obviously, you know, in the second half, you know, I mean, Whitney, he – Obviously didn't have the second half that he did in the first half. Yeah, had 11 points in the first half, six, uh, six points in the second half. We'll talk a little more about that second half and some of those big moments down the stretch in this three-point win in just a moment. But first, we're going to take a break from me at Montana's Ribbon Shop House. So we're stepping aside, and we'll be back after this. You're listening to Cat Chat, presented by Learfield.
Welcome back to Montana's Ribbon Chop House. We are live for Catch Chat. All right, we're talking about a couple of wins this week. I'm Keaton Gologli alongside head coach Danny Sprinkle. We're talking about this 67-64 uh, win in Missoula for the men. And uh, Coach, I kind of want to get into the last uh, five or so minutes of this ball game. Uh, one of the really big key plays in this game came from Darius Brown with about five minutes left. It was uh, a tie game, and he ended up with that steal and the transition bucket. That felt like one of those ones where it was like moment, uh, momentum was kind of building for Montana, and Darius Brown was right there to make a big play. Yep, sorry, it was. He got, a, he got a great deflection, but there was probably three really good de defensive efforts before that even happened. Uh, and Caleb uh, Fuller switched on to one of their guys, and he went baseline, and that's when he tried to wrap it around, and Darius got the steal on the other side and, and took it the length of the floor, and, which was a huge – you know, their crowd never really got loud until the last two minutes. Yeah. Uh, and there was 6,500 people there. I mean, it was, it was packed. And, uh, but it was because our guys kept responding, making big plays. Every time they would make a little run, our guys would make a play like that and then it would just kind of hush them up a little bit. Yeah, and uh, I mean, even those last couple minutes, and we'll get into some of the details here in a moment, I mean, how much did you feel like that non-conference schedule really prepared you to be able to play in that type of environment late in the game? Yeah, I mean, I think it definitely did. You know, and that's, you know, we do that intentionally and play in some of those environments. Um, you know, and our guys, they just, they never wavered. You know, you even the looks on their face, like they just, they were always kind of like, okay, well, we'll we're going to score. Like, we're good. We'll get a stop when we need to, you know. Yeah. but. And, uh, and it showed, you know, down the stretch, just the poise that they had. And, and a lot of that is Darius. You know, his, just, his demeanor never changes. And, and uh, you know, having a floor general out that like that is huge. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, all right, let's get through some of these moments. So, uh, you know, with about 90 seconds left, Deshaun Thomas, who we already talked about, he buried a big-time three in that game uh, to put them up. And uh, you call the timeout, you drop a play, and Darius Brown gets that and one to tie the thing right back up. That was a really impressive play. It was. I mean, our last three timeouts we scored out of, you know, he actually scored out of the one even previous with about two and a half minutes to go. Uh, but it was, it was a huge play. You know, it was, a, it was a ball screen action that we'd ran most of the game. And, uh, and they'd been struggling with it. And, and Darius made a great read. And he got his guy off his off his feet, you know, undisciplined. And he just went right up and got the end one. Yeah, you could see it. Brandon Whitney was a little yeah. jumpy on that. I mean, yeah. it wasn't much of a ball fake. And he just shot right up into the <laughs> yep. air. But it, a lot of it was because Darius was playing so well and shooting the ball so well. And so, you know, he had to kind of get up there. Yep. So uh, this was uh, one of those big free throws in this game. Montana State uh, in the second half of the free throw line went 15 for 16 down yep. the stretch, stretch. Those were the big shots at the end of this game. So uh, Brown ties it up. But Montana, give them credit. They came back. Brandon Whitney had a tough finish in the post uh, and <laughs> was able to put Montana back up by two. But you use your last time out with 49 seconds there to drop another play um, before the Raekwon battle foul and the three free throws. Are you worried about using your last time out in that window at the 49? second mark or what are you thinking in that moment we're using the timeout no because I knew how important it was for us to get a clean offensive possession you know obviously you know being down two yeah. you know we had to get something you know and I wanted to give our guys some confidence and you know we we're going to go for a two for one you know we wanted to score in the first 10 seconds out of the timeout you know and then try and get a stop and then obviously go win that thing and uh you know which we did yep and but it was a huge it was a huge play and it was a great play by Raekwon right you know going into the foul and, and drawing it We'll ask him about that in uh, just a little bit, uh, uh, in uh, a few minutes. But, um, you know, that was one of those ones where he goes right back to the line. And, you know, we had talked about it on the show. Free throws had been a struggle early in the yep. year. But how confident were you in Raekwon when he got to the line in that moment where it was three free throws to take a one-point lead? Yeah, I mean, I had no doubt. You know, he's he's a clutch player. You know, he's proved it over and over again, you know, even here. You know, but if there is a flair for the dramatic, you know, Raekwon's going to be there. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter if it's a half-court shot a pull-up jumper, a dunk, you know, anything like that. And, you know, once he got fouled, I knew we were going to be up by one, and then it was just going to come down to getting a stop. Well, and that was it, right? I mean, hey, we've been talking about it all year. This yep. defense has been one of your best aspects of this team all season long. Yep. How excited were you to know, okay, we just got to get two stops here, and we're going to be able to put this thing away. Yeah, and it was great because we actually, you know, we guarded them really well, and we guarded them so well they had to call a timeout, right. you know, because they were out of sorts, and they came out uh, with one of their sideline out-of-bounds plays, and – Guys did a tremendous job, and they got the ball to Moody, who was hot in that second half. Uh, but our guys did a great job staying in front of him, making uh, – Robert Ford, actually, and did a great job staying in front of him, making him make a tough shot, uh, and then got the big rebound. Yeah. Uh, Darius did and knocked down the free throws. Yeah, it looked like Ford was really playing some big minutes, had some he, really huge. big defensive stops in this game again. Had some great stops, you know, and that, that's what he does. You know, he's a tremendous defender on the ball especially. 
um, you know, he's just – he's strong and he's quick and he's hard to get around. Yeah. Yes, he is. So, uh, you put that away. You get the stop there. You get a second stop uh, against Moody. Brown hit the free throws to clinch it, and that was it, a 67-64 win. Uh, you'd won there as a player, but your first win as yeah. a head coach, that had to feel pretty special. Yeah, I mean, it was great. It's always good to win up there, and, you know, especially with how important that game is to the people in the state of Montana and especially Bobcat fans. And, uh, you know, our guys just – I mean, showed some tremendous resolve and, and found a way to get it done. Yep, uh, got through the handshake line and then jumped right into Jabril Bellow's arms. Yeah, he deserves it. You know, he's been <laughs> here He's been here for four years, and, and he's been up there twice, and we haven't been successful. And, uh, you know, I'm there, I mean, he's, he's put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into this program, and so I was, I was really happy for him. No doubt, changing the expectations. So he's 2-3 and three against Montana now in his career with at least one more at the end of the regular season. Yeah. So it's going to be fun to watch that one. No doubt. All right, uh, we're going to take a break, but we got Raekwon Battle coming up in a moment, so we'll talk to him about those free throws and the victory. Coach, congrats on the win, and uh, appreciate the time today. You bet. Thank you guys for all coming. Go Cats. All right, head coach Danny Sprinkle. We're going to take a break. We're sitting in Montana's Ribbon Shop House, and you're listening to Cat Chat, presented by Learfield. Welcome back to Montana's Ribbon Shop House. You, we are live here for Cat Chat. I'm Keaton Gilogaly, joined by uh, Ray Quan at Battle, talking about a one-game week, but it was a heck of a ball game. 67-64, the win in Missoula over the Montana Grizzlies. We're again joined by uh, Ray Quan Battle. Ray, how we doing? How we feeling? Doing good, man. We got a dinner paid for, so, you know. Can yeah, more than that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> love that. Having a chance with the, the rest of the team is here also, so they're all kicking yeah. back and enjoying some uh, ribbon chop house. What'd you order? What'd you get? Just I think it was called the baseball, like the baseball steak. Baseball yeah. steak. Yeah, it was okay. pretty good. Yeah, yeah, like pretty it. solid. Yeah. 
So you'd recommend it to somebody driving around and looking for dinner tonight? No doubt. No okay. doubt. Good yes, to sir. know. And the strawberry lemonade. Oh, so that's, that's always good. Yeah. Got to get that boost of sugar late. Exactly. <laughs> uh, all right, well, uh, let's get into some things. Let's talk about this game uh, in Montana. You had 18 points in this game. You had the big late free throws in this contest. Uh, tell me a little bit about that play the, where you drew the foul, knocked down the fr uh, free throws. First of all, so was that one of those plays where you kind of felt the contact and, like, jumped into it to try to draw the foul? Yeah, um, there was kind of a mix-up during the play. Um, I ended up getting open, though, because I just sprinted off it and – he was, like, kind of on my hip, so I felt him. So I just – I knew it was going to be a foul if he was that close to me. Yeah. Especially if I'm rising up. So I just, like, kind of waited, pump faked a little bit and, you know, drew the foul and shooting the free throws. I love that. So yeah. that's a, that is a thing. Like, is that kind of one of those, like, one of those skills where you know a guy is, like, on you and you can draw a foul in that moment? Yeah, you just got to have a feel for the game, really. Just yeah. knowing your surroundings. If he's right on you, it's the perfect time to rise up and draw a foul. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what was it like when you were getting to that free throw line? I mean, how confident were you in that moment? Man, like, too confident. I've been shooting free throws for too long to not be confident about it. Uh, and it was fun, though. Like, every time I'm shooting, like, big game free throws, I'm always thinking, like, my mom's going to be mad at me if I miss these. So, like, <laughs> I, I can't miss these right now. Yeah. yeah. What else does she get mad about you on the basketball court about? Um, Kind of, like, I have, like, her attitude okay. when it comes to playing. Yeah, yeah. So, like, she'll tell me to knock it off, not show that a little bit, but, you know. That's a little personal conversation with her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, mm -hmm. we've seen that a little bit up and down. We've seen other teams try to goat you a little bit. Yeah. I mean, what's uh, what's it like? Like, how do you how do you try to calm it down? Who's uh, who's one of the guys in your ear to kind of bring you back down to earth in those big moments when the competitiveness is really go really going? Uh, I'll say Jabril. Yeah. Yeah. Jabril's like me, and he's like my best friend on the team, really. So, um, you know, he'll calm me down every time. He'll cut. He'll put me in check, really. So he's yeah. like a brother on the floor. All of them are our brothers. Like Darius, he's a uh, point guard. So he kind of controls the whole team so he'll come to me as well like yo chill out dude like we, we can't afford nothing you know so just keep your head straight and you know that helps me a lot yeah yeah mm -hmm. hey man it's a it's a, an emotional game everybody wants to be their best and i know yeah. teams are going to want to come after you because you're the best you know you're you're scoring more points than anybody else <laughs> yes sir <laughs> uh well let's uh let's uh, tell us a little bit about uh, darius brown i mean obviously he's had a tremendous season what did you see in his game i mean the 23 points in this game against montana so much fun to watch him go to work what stood about out about his performance on saturday um, just him being able to space the floor, like Darius Brown, really that man. So like he could he could shoot three, he can get downhill, he can get the mid range. Like it's all of, it's kind of what I do, but in the point guard, you know. Yeah. Like he's a point guard, he's able to pass it as well. So it's dangerous when the ball's in his hands. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, he's mm -hmm. a true three level scorer at this point. Exactly. Yeah, you don't get too many of those. Mm -hmm. uh, what was it like when he first got here? I mean, it, it takes a while for a point guard to get used to his new teammates, understand the leadership role. So you know, what were what were your first impressions when Darius first got here? Um, I didn't really have an impression, kind of. Like, we – like, everyone on the team kind of clicked. Like, yeah. it's his personality that kind of get like puts him in the point guard form. Like, his personality is just, you know, he's outgoing. He's a funny dude. So, like, he can he can kind of take all the attention in the room, you know. So, for him to be, like, leading our team, that's the perfect person to do it. He can draw so much attention and then kick it to the corner to me or Tyler or somebody in, in the corner. So Yeah. yeah. Uh, was it, was it kind of quick in the way he, he stepped in that leadership role or did it take a little bit of time? Um, definitely a little bit of time. You know, we had to uh, lose a couple games here early on, you know, so it was good. Like, we all had to figure out what our really our role was when it comes to being, like, a new team that we have this year. So Yeah. yeah. When did you feel like that started to come together? Ooh, great question. Um, I mean, I've got a date in my head. Yeah, I would say Northern Colorado. Okay. Yeah, Northern Colorado, man. Uh, they have some great scorers on their team. Yeah. Um, and our, our whole idea was just to take all three of them out, and we took literally all three of them out, like, they couldn't do anything. As soon as that happened, um, I mean, all of us were just hitting on all cylinders, so that's yep. pretty good. Now, and then yeah. it was from there into that Northern Arizona game, and that was a dogfight of a game, that yeah. hot start. But, you know, Northern Arizona's scrappy, man. They got some good mm -hmm. scores. That was definitely an important win in that one, too. Exactly. So moving yeah. through that, and, and now here we are about to get uh, halfway through the Big Sky season. The midway mm -hmm. point is this Portland State game uh, coming up over this uh, over this weekend. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about talk to you a little bit about uh, how you got here, how you got into uh, got to Montana State after the transfer from Washington. Uh, yeah. What were some of the conversations like with Coach Sprinkle? Like what was what stood out, and what do you remember about those conversations? I mean, what stood out to me is just how honest he was. Like yeah. Sprink doesn't hold anything back. Like he <laughs> told me, he said, if you come here, like I expect you to be like a leader. I expect you to be a starter. I expect you to be, you know, following through with whatever we got to do. But he said it's not going to be easy. Yeah. Like you know, you're, you're going to have to earn certain things and. I didn't start one game last year, but I earned, ended up being six-man of the year. So, like, I just bought in from the jump, and whatever he said, I did it. And 
We won a championship. Yes, you did. And yeah. you got another chance to win one this year for sure. Exactly. I like it. Bigger role this year, though. For yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, well, how's that bigger role been for you? I mean, how different is it to be the guy? It's fun. Uh, I mean, I kind of always have that mindset of being, like, the aggressive scorer and being able to draw so much attention from teams and um, and even fans. You know, it's crazy being in the college uh, the college atmosphere. We're going, we went to Southern Utah, and there's people saying, like, People I've never even seen, they have my name on posters and saying, like, oh, Raekwon, you left your game at home or something like that. <laughs> and I'm like, it's kind of random, you know? Yeah. So it's cool, though. I enjoy it a lot. Is that, so you, you draw some, like, motivation from that? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'm definitely down. some wind of the sails. Yeah, that's right. Uh, we're talking with Raekwon Battle, and uh, I do want to ask you about your mom. You know, you, you kind of mentioned her and, and mm -hmm. what uh, what she sees in some of your free throws and that sort of thing. What's her role been in, in your ba basketball career? Um, What is it? I would say, like, my mom is a basket. She grew up playing basketball, so like she was an incredible shooter. You know that's kind of where I get it from. Mm -hmm. um, and she was able to like stir me in the right direction. You know, not a lot of people had the guidance that she gave me mm -hmm. coming out of uh, you know where we come from. So it was pretty uh, pretty cool having her by my side at every game. Like we would have twenty dollars or something, and like for the uh, a whole tournament, and my mom would like get me to those tournaments with that twenty dollars. Like I would, it was that was it. The tournament could be like two or three hours away or in a different uh different state and she would make it work. We would just have lunch meetings and stuff, you know, and do what we can to survive and you know, I end up playing pretty well at basketball and hopefully I can return the favor. Yeah, no mm -hmm. doubt. And so yeah, uh, you kinda mentioned she was like a shooter, so like what kind of player was she? Like tell us a little bit more about her love for the game and, and just kinda what player she was. Yeah, my mom was like, she was a real deal shooter too, but she was like a hooper overall. Like yeah. she, I mean, she was an athlete overall. She played different sports like soccer, baseball, or softball, I should say, um, you know, stuff like that. So she was able to like have that grit growing up. So, you know, I kind of took that away from her. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. I love to hear those kind of stories, man. Mm -hmm. So, so I mean, were you guys playing one-on-one -on -one, like in the, uh, you know, the driveway or wherever, like local court or hoops or wherever? Um, not so much because my mom ended up hurting her leg. Like, oh, okay. yeah, that's kind of why she stopped playing. So she wasn't on the floor as much, but she was definitely like in my ear yeah. every time. So, you know, it didn't matter who I was playing. Like it could be my 13 year old brother and she's telling me to go hard against him, you know, <laughs> so really stirred yeah. the pot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, final thing I want to ask you a little bit about it is, uh, you know, is your tribe to Laylip and, uh, just tell us a little bit about the culture and, and the people there and just what it was like and, and what, uh, what stands out? Like what part of the culture do you carry with you every day? Um, I would just say like the, the family type thing. And it's not just the family like, back home, like in my immediate family. It's also like the family I have in uh, Bozeman, you know, so that kind of extends all the way over here and being able to, you know, show my culture in a place like that has how many, uh, reservations are here. Do you know? I'm not sure. No. Yeah. There's a good amount of reservations yeah. out here. So, um, I can connect on that when it comes to just being from a reservation myself in Washington. So coming over here was pretty easy, like a good, uh, easy adjustment because I also have family in Billings and like from the Crow Agency area. Mm -hmm. um, so it's pretty cool to be able to represent my tribe and bring it over to Montana because we're the coast. So yeah. we're also the, uh, like a coastal, uh, coastal Salish tribe. So it's pretty cool to bring my Salish roots and over to the countryside. How does yeah. it compare to some of the, the tribes that are here and in the countryside? Like, what are some of the differences and the things you guys connect on? Uh, definitely different, man. We're more, of, we're more of, like, we're on the water a lot. We have a lot of canoes and whatnot. So, out here, there's a lot of horses. Okay. So, yeah. So, yeah. It's, a, it's pretty, uh, not a big difference, but there's a difference in there. Yeah, yeah. but it's got to be nice to be able to kind of meet other people and, and dive into those differences and the nuances and just be able to have those types of conversations. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, and, and, you know, I don't know, there's been a... There's been a number of people who have come from tribes, Native Americans, who have played at Montana State, mm -hmm. at the University of Montana. Was that a, a part of your decision to come here at all, or was that just kind of more of a coincidence? Um, yeah, it, I mean, I had options, but I would say it definitely was a coincidence because this is the place I would have chosen, like, if they were the first ones to, like, come to me, just yeah. because of their pitch was uh, – I like their pitch from – like considered from other teams and stuff. Their pitch was way better than, yeah. you know, from other like teams. a basketball standpoint. Yeah, exactly. So and not just that, the cultural standpoint too. Like what drew me in was the fans. You know, the fans are amazing. I love them. Everywhere I go, like like there's always – I'm taking a picture, you know, signing something or they are off when to buy me some food or something. And, you know, I just love it. So yeah, that's fun. cool, man. It's, uh, it's yeah. amazing how much uh, Bobcat Nation and Cat Country really travel around the mm -hmm. country and support you all while we're out on the road. Exactly. Yeah, that's uh, it's pretty cool stuff. So you hear that, fans? We hear you, and you mm -hmm. are some of the people sure. that are bringing great players like this into Bozeman. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Love that. Well, Raekwon, this has been so much fun to watch you work this season, continue That's to grow, up. and I know uh, we've had some great memories so far, and we've got some great ones coming up, no doubt. Yes, no doubt about it. All right, That's Raekwon up. Battle, appreciate that time. Thank you, guys.
All right, we're going to take a break, and uh, when we get back, there was another win in Missoula. That was on the women's side. We'll be talking about that with head coach Trisha Binford after this timeout. We're sitting in Montana's Ribbon Chop House, and you're listening to Cat Chat, presented by Learfield. Welcome live to Montana's Ribbon Chop House for Cat Chat. At Montana's Ribbon Chop House, our staff is dedicated to creating extraordinary experiences that raise the bar in each of our communities. Enjoy premium steaks, fresh seafood, and award-winning baby back ribs. We look forward to sharing a little Rocky Mountain hospitality with you. I'm Keaton Gologli, joined now by head coach Trisha Binford. Coach, how we doing? I'm doing great. Yes. Heck of a week, the, the one-game week, so always a, a little bit different with the one-game week, but I'm sure emotionally it can feel like two games. It sure does, but uh, what a great job by the men's team and uh, for both teams to get the sweep over the weekend. And, uh, yeah, now you got to turn the page and get ready for the, the week ahead. Yes, no doubt about that with, uh, with Portland State and Sac State coming up at home. So uh, if you're here in Bozeman this weekend, uh, make sure you check that out. So Thursday at 7 o'clock and Saturday at uh, 1 o'clock against Portland State and uh, Sac State. And, uh, you know, how do you like the, uh, the, the doubleheader? Do you like it when it's the, the two games going like that the same day on the same court? I do. I would love if they would get them a little bit closer together because okay. it would be nice to stay and support the men. And, 
uh, at the same time, when we get home, we're probably catching that second half. And, uh, yeah, and talking with Danny, I think he'd be up for that as well. It's a long day for the men to wait. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, and uh, so, so were you guys able to catch any of that game on the bus? Like, where were you guys when, yeah, uh, we by the time? <clears throat> pretty much watched all of it on the bus. And uh, I think we, once we got dropped off, the last on our, you know, small phones uh, when we were driving home was when Raquan, Raquan was uh, hitting the free throws. So, uh, great job uh, by the men finishing uh, with style, right? Yeah, yes, love Get the style. Get everybody on the edge of their seats. <laughs> Tons of style points in that yeah. game for sure. Um, yeah, that's always fun when the uh, when the whole bus is kind of locked oh, in and you awesome. hear everybody che cheering yeah, all through that. Yeah, it was that. awesome. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. Well, all right, let's talk about your game. We've talked about the men enough. Women win this one 72-63. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that first half, man, that was a dogfight. That was back and forth. Uh, tell me a little bit about that first half and just kind of what you saw in those first 20 minutes. Yeah, I mean, we <clears throat> did a great job. The kids came out right from the stretch, uh, really focused, locked in uh, on the on the scattering port. I thought they did a great job containing penetration, and uh, really it was the three ball that was giving us a, a little bit of havoc, and it was uh, the Grizz bench uh, came in and, and hit some big shots for them. And, uh, but at the same time, we felt like we were battling. We, we kept uh, going into huddles on a couple of uh, key elements. And, you know, just we, we continue to have kids rotating in and giving us a big spark, Grace being one of them who's here with us tonight. And uh, just really liked how things were going uh, on the defensive end from keeping the ball out of the post play, uh, just finishing plays, and really just had to address that three ball at halftime. Yeah, uh, you know, we'll talk with Grace Beasley here in the next segment, which will be a lot of fun, but she had a couple of amazing passes, especially in that first half, that overhand baseball pass from, like, the backcourt right wing all the way underneath the cup. That is something special to be able to see a pass like that. Yeah, my husband was telling her he's already seen it three times on ESPN Plus, watching the replay, but, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, one of the remarkable gifts that she has, she just has tremendous vision. She'll find you anywhere, and, and she was just telling us at the table that she was talking to Leah about, hey, she's you can cut behind her, and and, and I'll find you, and she'll find you. So sometimes uh, you might not be looking. You better have those hands up because she's, <laughs> she's going to make a great pass there. Yeah, and it's going to be on the money. So if you don't have your hands up, you're going to get hit. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, John Stockton said, you know, uh, hit him in the back of the head one time. They'll have their hands up next time. Yeah, so I, like I think that's a pretty good tip. <laughs> now, on the defensive side, you guys did a great job against Carmen G. Feller in this game. She picked up two fouls in the first five minutes. What would you guys do, and how were you guys successful against G. Feller in this game? Well, defensively, we really wanted to keep it out of the post play. They're very efficient once they catch there. And I thought the, the opening possession really set the tone for us. Uh, we had shown them some clips of where we could be disruptive. And uh, the very first possession, Lexi was able to get a steal sneaking around. And so that set the tone. It, we um, uh, congested a little bit, made it difficult to get there. Uh, Lexi does what she does best, and that was uh, disrupting. But then Cola got matched, Taylor matched uh, as well. Our entire post play, that was one of our, our best post defensive performances as a group all year and you know we were talking a fast break today you know you got to pick your poisons uh, sometimes when you take something else off the board it's going to open up uh, a little bit from the perimeter but we really address the post play being a key element to take away yeah no doubt i mean lexi deaton in this game uh daniel sally called her on the uh, on the podcast the bobcat insider podcast this week uh, she called her the uh, agent of chaos and i feel like that was really, really after what she was doing in the post absolutely in that game. yeah you know um uh, somebody asked uh, in the media after that game about you know she wasn't hitting her her shots uh, like she has been down the stretch but there's so many other things that she's impacting the game with and one of those is uh you know her areas of making entries a little bit more difficult you might be entering it to the elbow and she gets you to catch it a little bit further away so now they're out of a rhythm uh, situation and the same goes for you know her on the offensive end we we got pushed away uh they to credit montana's credit they did a good job uh pushing our post uh, away from catching it where we wanted to catch it but both lexi and cola were following shots and getting some second opportunities and rebounds and those are the extra possessions that are going to make a difference uh, down the stretch and whether you're finishing on that win win column or loss column and lexi does that all the time yeah i know i you know you look at the numbers and she went three of 12 from the field but it felt like all three of those shots that she hit were really high degrees of difficulty difficulty in that game and you know some of them were those second chance opportunities but felt like her finishing ability even if it was only the three those three were really really difficult for sure you know they did a great job too they knew that we want to go through our 
post play and and so it was congested for us as well and so you had to find some other factors and you know that's where Darian White got going Grace got going uh, we had some opportunities for our point guards to get into the paint there and uh, uh, to our our team I, I just feel like we have some really good balance if something's taken off the board we can find some other ways but uh, I felt like the post play has really been evolving as as far as the way they're sharing the ball and finding some open teammates uh, when we are getting double teamed so often, and they did a really good job there. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, uh, Cola Bad Bear in this game, 13 points, seven rebounds, two assists, no turnovers, one block, three steals. She was three of four from the free throw line. She had five offensive rebounds in this game. I mean, she was an absolute star in this ball game. Yeah, and my clips that I showed today was – her keeping the ball out of the post play and that doesn't even have a stat to it so right. you're looking at the things she did from the statistical standpoint but what she did in our, our defensive system you know it's really helpful to have experienced post you know it takes some time to evolve great post defense because so much of it is countering and the feel for it and really she just did a great job of anticipating where the ball was going to be for what her next next situation was but on the offensive end like you said she was everywhere for us she was attack minded for us um, but she's really um, just getting that kind of slowing her game down so to speak to see what the option is whether it's for her to attack or to find a teammate and her rebounding was really really tough for us yeah no doubt that was fun to watch and the other part too of this is you know she really bounced back if you think back to last year she was one of 15 for the field the two meetings against Montana and for her to come back and have this type of performance like that's how you see the growth those are the types of things that are make this this level of basketball just watching the growth from year to year so much fun for sure I think uh, the biggest thing that our team did from this year versus last year is we won that game between the ears um, prior uh, as far as our, our approach mentally our approach uh, as a team collectively and how we stayed focused on what we could control in the environment and you know the the this was last year was kind of coming off of a year from COVID, so we didn't have the fans in that gym. And so it was a little bit uh, of a surprise, even though our freshman class had experienced that previously, whereas this year we knew what we were going into. Uh, we were definitely prepared for it. Um, we really focused on uh, simplifying the play call list at the other end for Grace and Darian to take the ownership of that until we got them in front of us at the second half. So there's some things that I felt like we progressed in, but as far as the team and, and staying locked in on each other, they were ready to go from the start and they did it for an entire 40 minutes of every time Montana made that run, I thought our kids were ready to respond to that run. No doubt. Finally, Darian White in this game, 22 points, seven rebounds in this contest. She had 20 points in the first three quarters of this game. How about this, Darian White now against uh, against Montana, six and one in her career. Not too shabby for Darian White. So love to see those types of things from some of the seniors. But I mean, she just looked like she had that look on her face, especially in that third quarter. Yeah, she's definitely uh, hitting that 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 groove of. Um getting her teammates involved, taking her pull up when it's available, getting the ball in her hands, uh, end of quarters uh, in some stretches there. But I just loved her fight right right out of the gate. Um, I felt like our point guard play between her and Grace um, right, right from the start and then when we made our substitutions, we're just really attack minded in the right way, right from the get, uh, get go. And it just continued throughout the course of that game. But she was definitely in her zone when she gets to that pull up and you see that spin, you know, good things are happening for us. <laughs> no doubt. That's why She's got over 1,500 career points in the blue and gold. All right, uh, coming up this week, Portland State at 7 o'clock over at the Brick, and then Sac State on Saturday at 1 o'clock. On Saturday, if you wear pink, it's only 5 bucks to get in, so it's the Pack the Place in Pink game plus National Girls and Women in Sport Day. So it's going to be a big game on Saturday both for that and because of what's at stake in the standings. But don't want to look ahead. Thursday, Portland State, 7 o'clock team that's kind of hit their stride lately. What are some of the keys fans should look for in this game against Portland? Well, Portland State's leading the conference in steals per game right now, and they're doing that in a 2-3 zone. Uh, they're going to pick you up on made baskets in a, in a press, a 2-2-1 two, two, press, and then their 2-3 their zone has a little bit of a 1-3-1 one, one element to it, and, and it really kind of stretches the floor. So we're going to have to really um, be sharp with our passes and how we attack it uh, and take care of the basketball on the offensive end. So our post play is going to be huge for us, but I think our guard play is going to be really important. Um, we're obviously going to have to be shot ready. We're going to have to get some second opportunities on the glass. But on the defensive end for us, uh, this is a team that's going to continuous ball screen, continuous ball screen, and they have one of the leading scores in the conference at the point guard position. And, and so we're going to have to make sure we're just maintaining pressure throughout. 
uh, the course of that. And uh, the glass is going to be a key element for us, but I think that uh, turnover count, who's forcing more turnovers and who's taking care of the basketball, it's what it's going to come down to. And maybe the sixth man, which is our, which is our crowd. We yes. need our crowd No for sure. doubt about it. We've already heard how important they are a little earlier today with uh, helping recruit fans just basically by showing up. That's all you got to do. That's all we need. Uh, you mentioned the turnovers and ball control. Uh, final stat out of this Montana win. Nine turnovers by Montana State, and y'all forced 18 with 12 steals. That is certainly a winning formula. Absolutely. Anytime you can extra possessions, you're getting yourself a great shot. No doubt about it. All right, we're going to take a break, but we got Grace Beasley joining us for our final segment coming up after this timeout. We are live at Montana's Ribbon Chop House, and you're listening to Cat Chat, presented by Learfield. We are back at Montana's Ribbon Chop House for Cat Chat. Montana's Ribbon Chop House has been serving Rocky Mountain communities for over 20 years. Our ability to grow has come through our commitment to Rocky Mountain hospitality, a concept which incorporates a casual attitude with our commitment to loyalty, safety, service, and quality food. We hope you'll be our guest at one of our Montana locations soon. We also want to remind you that Universal Athletic has been a proud supporter of Bobcat Athletics for over 45 years. Shop their great selection of Bobcat apparel and accessories for all your game day needs. Shop in-store at their North 7th Avenue locations or online at shop.msubobcats.com. Go Cats. All right, we're in our final segment of Cat Chat this week. Of course, we're here at Montana's Ribbon Chop House each Tuesday night 
at uh, 6 30. I'm Keaton Glogley now joined by Grace Beasley. Grace how we doing? Doing well thank you for having me. Yes absolutely so your first time here at the Ribbon Chop House? Yes. Kind of a nice place. Yeah. I know I like it. Yeah this is definitely a good place to come. <laughs> you know, a lot of good TVs you can watch the games they've got a lot of Bobcat stuff all exactly. over the walls. So yeah you'll be back here I have no <laughs> doubt. For sure. Um, all right so Grace you're from Australia which part of Australia are you from? Melbourne. Okay cool so one of the big cities. Yes. All right yep. um, and how did you get into hoops? Uh, I know there's been plenty of Australian players who have done a lot, and I know there's some pro leagues over there, but what was your first indoctrination into basketball growing up? Uh, my way of getting into basketball was just my older sister. Um, they needed a fill-in one game, and I was kind of just sitting on the bench watching, and they I just quickly put on a uniform and jumped in and turned out to be all right. Yeah. So, yeah. How much older were, were she and the, the players? 18 months. So okay. she's 18 months older. So about two years older, I was playing with their age group for a few years. Yeah. Do you remember, like, one of the plays out of that game? You're like, wow, this, ain't, this game might be easy. Yeah, I think it was my strength on the passes and things like that. I was like, wow, maybe I can keep up with them. So, yeah. yeah. that's cool. That's yeah. cool. And then so kind of dove into there. What's the uh, – I mean, obviously here in the States, we've got, like, the AAU circuit, and that's how people kind of get into it. How do people get into it in Australia? Like, if you're a good player who's got high – you know high goals what are some of the things you do and, and how do you play it and build that way yeah so we have something called representative basketball and that's sort of like our AAU um, so you kind of join a representative team and um, you'll get picked for either a first second third team depending on how many players there are um, and then you sort of go from there and compete in your state um, and then at the age of 16, you can kind of get suited up for a women's team if you're good enough and start playing with some really high-level players. Right. And was that something you were able to do? Yeah, luckily enough. I stayed with my club since I was eight years old. Um, so I was there until I left for college, and I luckily got to join the women's team at the age of 15, 16. Yeah, that's cool. What was yeah. uh, what was the style of play like that? It's got to be really fun to just play with some players who are so experienced. Definitely. It was high IQ. A lot of them had already graduated from college, Oklahoma State, Gonzaga, some really big schools, um, played on the national team in Australia. So it was fun learning under them, especially at such a young age. I think I learned a lot. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Um, all right, so you go through that, and uh, you come over here to the States, and you play at the JUCO level. How did you find your, your junior college, and what was your experience like there? Yeah, I loved it. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. <laughs> yeah. But I think just coming over to the States and playing basketball, I think that's a dream come true for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Um, definitely missed the family, but it was all worth it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I absolutely loved junior college. I think it was a really good stepping stone into college as well. And, um, a big family environment in Midland, which helped me settle in a lot. Yeah. Midland, uh, Texas, right? Yes. Yeah. Midland, Texas. I know there's a Midland, Michigan. I think there's a few, but anyway, um, so yeah, down in Texas and, and doing that and, uh, kind of settle in. So, you know, did you have some D1 offers or was it just kind of the JUCO round when you were coming out and, and getting over to the States? Um, I actually just went through a connection. I didn't really do the whole recruitment process. I okay. didn't really know how to go about it. Um, so it was just a connection. He played at Midland. Um, he's about 15 years older than me, but because I was on the women's team at such a young age, I got to kind of meet all the men's players, the women's players, and we all connected as a club. Um, so he kind of um, got me to Midland College through the head coach that was still there. Um, when he was there. Right on. Okay. Yeah. So you went from there out to Seattle, out to the University of Washington. Yes. Um, but we're only there for the year and did not play, right? So that was an injured year for yes. you? Yes. Okay. Um, but then you did end up transferring. Now, did you transfer to Washington during COVID or was that, did you transfer out after COVID? It was during COVID. I had just, it was sort of the start of COVID yeah. that I had sort of got there. There wasn't really any visits allowed or anything. So it was all sort of over the phone That's and tough. things like that. So it definitely was tough, but uh, once I signed, about a month later, they kind of opened things up a little bit, and I got to fly out there for okay. a few days. Okay. And then, uh, so you're there for the year. You kind of rehab, going through the injury, and then uh, you ended up coming here to Montana State. So uh, what was it about Montana State? How did you get linked up with them, and what was your first initial impressions? Yeah, it was my uh, junior college assistant coach that kind of reached out to Sonny Smallwood, um, a connection in the basketball world. Um, and I think a big thing that sold me here was stability um, in the coaching staff, being here for 17, 18 years, um, especially going through sort of a situation where my coach um, had to leave uh, the University of Washington. So I think that was a big thing I was looking for, um, as well as I kind of really enjoyed the small town environment yeah. um, after being in a big city and especially during COVID. Um, you were very isolated, even though you were in a big city around a lot of people. So I think coming here... 
um, it definitely felt like a lot more at home and you could kind of connect with people and I would like to think I'm a bit more of a people person. So I kind of like to get to know people and in Seattle I felt like I couldn't really do that as much. Yeah, so yeah, this is a great uh, atmosphere and a great family and all of that. Um, so when did you actually get here? Because you got here last year, is that right? Yeah, I got here in the middle of January. Okay, yeah. and so you, and you, were you able to practice a little bit? or? Uh, I could a little bit, yes. Yeah. I think it took me a little bit to get cleared with insurance and things, but once I started, it was it was all good. Yeah, was it hard to practice knowing like you weren't going to get out into a game there at that window? It was, definitely. I think at the time I was just trying to learn a lot, though, um, kind of learn the system and everything, and um, everything I knew and had just learned, I kind of had to find my way into the new system and program and um, learn from the players, so um, they helped me a lot. Yeah, and so you feel like you're kind of into it now? Yes, slowly, slowly, <laughs> definitely. I think we're I think we're hitting a turning point. Yeah. Okay, good. So, I mean, do you feel like you're hitting a turning point, like in this last Montana game, or a little before that? Like, where do you feel like you're kind of? Was there a moment where you're like, oh, you know what? I think I am getting this. Yeah, I think it can be small things, even in practice, just like you know, mousing a post. I feel like that's something that I've struggled <laughs> with a little big bit. Pump, big pump of the fist for <laughs> Coach Finn. Yeah, so I think it's just small things like that, and I'm like, okay, okay. So I don't know. I think it's just practice, and I just need to keep getting reps at it and keep improving. Yeah, well, tell us about a couple of these, like, long passes we saw, especially in this Montana game. You had not one but two where you had some long passes ahead um, and able to find some of your teammates. Tell me about that first one. I mean, that that is a dime. I don't know if I could have done that with, like, a baseball or a football, much less to do it with one hand and a basketball. Yeah, it was it was, it was was nice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's one way to describe know. it. I was definitely nervous a little bit throwing it. But yeah. Um, yeah, no, I kind of saw an opening and I told Leah just before the play had started, I was like, Leah, she's not guarding you. And I think, you know, I had a lot of trust in Leah to catch that pass as well. So knowing personnel and knowing Leah, like she's definitely a very athletic player that can get that pass. Yeah, I don't know. I got two bricks instead of hands. I might have been able to catch that pass. <laughs> it was right in there. Um, but so that's interesting that you say that, um, you know, it was something you saw before the play, like you had seen something kind of open. So, yeah, that that, that, that kind of pass is something where, you know, it, it was almost a little premeditated. Yes, Yeah. That, definitely. Okay, that's uh, that's cool. Now, <laughs> do you practice that? Like, are, are during practice, are you like, okay, I want to work on some of my longer passes? No. Okay, no. so that's more natural than anything. Yeah. yeah, a bit more of a natural read, I think, and just – I don't know. I think the game was kind of just flowing, and um, I felt pretty confident with it. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, once I saw it, I kind of thought it was open. <laughs> yeah, and it certainly was. <laughs> uh, tell us a little bit about that environment, too. I mean, obviously, we're going to have an environment similar to that. Um, you know, great crowds here year in and year out and throughout the, throughout the season. Obviously, it's going to be a massive moment here on February 18th when we get the doubleheader against the Grizzlies again. But, I mean, had you played in an environment like that before when, you, when we were in Montana? Um, I don't think so maybe back home in australia um okay. but definitely probably not in the states um so that was definitely a very cool experience um the girls and everyone were definitely prepping me for it yeah so they were definitely in my ear telling me and i think the week leading up to that game we were sort of trying to find out signals and things like that um just in case we couldn't hear and um yeah but it was definitely um a great experience and i feel very lucky that i got to play in it yeah so some of the crowds in australia were that big and, and that kind of that rambunctious definitely yeah when it becomes finals time in australia i definitely think fans start to roll in a lot more yeah that's cool that's always fun man mm -hmm. especially when you get a chance to play in front of crowds like that exactly well i have no doubt you'll get some more this weekend against portland state and sac state and of course again for the uh, the doubleheader brawl of the wild coming up on February 18th, Grace Beasley, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. All right, Grace Beasley. Thank you to Grace. Thank you to head coach Trisha Binford. Thank you uh, to Danny Sprinkle and Raekwon Battle for joining us today as well. And Will Gordon is our producer. And finally, a thank you to uh, Rib and Chop House. This is Keaton Gologli saying so long and go Cats.